And um, this is the second session in the colloquium series that uh, follows and goes hand in hand with a course that I'm teaching jointly with Rafael Sanchez. Um, and the series is, is titled Patrimony, Space, and Performance in, in Latin American Cities. And those are the, those terms, I think, embody the, the critical themes that we're, we're trying to pursue, the relationship between uh, ideas about patrimony in the Spanish sense, about um, uh, claims to possession of, of property, of personal property, of lineage property, of heritage, claims to the past and to rootedness, and the ways in which uh, urban forms uh, and, and the, the architectural spaces of, of cities which are critically important to, to 16th century uh, Castile, and modern Spain, and uh, Latin America as a result of the uh, Spanish colonization projects, um, are, are uh, in, within those spaces performed uh, in order to produce uh, social cohesion, forms of solidarity, but also invidious forms of social distinction um, in the split between uh, public and private kinds of spaces. Uh, for example, establishing the conditions necessary to, to create uh, uh, distinctions of gender uh, as well as exclusions that make it possible to, um, uh, to uh, distinguish between elites and, uh, and, uh, and the uh, oppressed between, in contemporary terms, races and classes uh, in 16th century terms between social estates and, um, and national kinds of uh, alterity. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Jovita Baber. She is an old friend and uh, an interlocutor, frequent interlocutor uh, uh, on these kinds of themes. She is a, a PhD in history from the University of Chicago, is assistant professor of history at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, and um, is in the process of completing a book that uh, I think will turn on its head the um, uh, conventional understandings of the of processes of, of reducción, of the Spanish imposition of of uh, forms of urban life uh, on indigenous people in the Americas by demonstrating the degree to which these were in fact indigenous plans uh, and forms of negotiation with power and uh, means of obtaining privilege and, and protection. And her, her talk today is on indigenous founding and governance of colonial Tlaxcala um, I'll provide a few comments at the end and then hopefully lead into a, a general discussion. So please uh, welcome Jovita Baber. Um, so thank you very much for coming out on this rainy day, even though I think you were already in the building maybe and kept, have been dry for a little while at least. So I um, pre-circulated um, two papers. Oh, hmm. Somehow the one that I was going to show you didn't get saved to here. That's okay. It has most of the slides that I wanted on this one. But I pre-circulated two papers. One of them was about the idea of uh, rep self-representation and made an argument that naciones um, was not the, w was a more accurate way in which we should think about the idea of indios um, than, than using the term indios. And that um, I think that maybe it's my fault that somehow I left it on. Try this one, yeah. There we go. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Um, that naciones is a more accurate depiction than the idea of race and caste. And I'm going to come back to that particular one toward the end. Um, I want to spend a little bit more time kind of talking about the nuts and bolts about how 
um, urban spaces are being established, how they're being negotiated, um, and then come back to that because I think it'll lend you, uh, lend to a, a final slide that I have that can talk about the way in which this space of Tlaxcala begins to be um, created into a uh, multi uh, racial, ethnic, cultural space and yet is perceived as an Indian space. So in essence, I'm going to take, instead of sticking just to a paper and doing the traditional paper talk, I'm going to take these two papers, follow the one a little more closely, but try to bring them together then at the end. So the one that I'm really going to spend a bit more time on and, and um, laying out uh, some maps and things to look at in order to uh, bring home the primary points is the one where I talk about empires and how native people are interacting with empire and the effect that those interactions are having on the on the ground development of empire as well as some of the bureaucratic structures that get put into place. Then we'll come back to categories of self-representation. So just as a, my sense of what I think that I was doing when I wrote the paper, the big points that I was trying to make in this first paper is that Tlaxcalans themselves transformed their confederacy into municipality and they pursued the status of city, which was the highest ranking status one can acquire within Castilian municipal framework. And they did this in order to acquire relative autonomy within the emerging imperial system. And why did the crown accept that um, pursuit of uh, status and grant it to Tlaxcalans? They did it because they, the, the crown at this particular time was attempting to transition governance of the empire from a medieval notion of governing using aristocratic, um, uh, aristoc an aristocracy based on the military and transitioning that to a bureaucracy where the king was the head of the bureaucracy and it was a logical system. Now um, one of the arguments that I consistently am making is that there's a difference between the bureaucracy that's the ideal and the bureaucracy that has flexibility and so at this point of transition the bureaucracy remains incredibly flexible because it's, it's uh, very new. Um, the Castilians aren't quite sure how it's going to um, play out, what it's going to evolve to. But on paper, it looks very structured. Um, and it's that it's at this nexus, this point at which this is coming together and these transitions are occurring that allow indigenous people to insert themselves and actually begin to shape the way in which empire is um, taking shape and forming. And that ultimately the argument is that the imperial system isn't an imperial system that can be imposed. It's an imperial system that's actually emerging through a fluid convergence of negotiated interests. And that indigenous people are actively involved in these interests. So I wanted to, for a moment, kind of show that this is has a contemporary aspect to it, that when you think about Latin America, it's not that these are events that happen uh, in the 1600s, 1500s, that have no impact to today, but rather the very place that we're talking about is now a state in Mexico. And that indigenous peoples, activities in the colonial period gave um, rise to particular spatial um, configurations that still impact the way that the political geography exists within Latin America. And in this case, this, these are the boundaries that were being negotiated in the 16th century. So I don't know if you can see this, um, the, some of the geographical uh, markings are not so clear, but essentially this is Tlaxcala before the arrival of Cortez and, and through a period shortly after um, Cortez had arrived. And to me, this is a really important image to show because um, when I talk about Tlaxcala, people that are very familiar with New Spain and Mesoamerica often have in their heads either a Gibsonian notion of what Tlaxcala was at the time of contact or a Lockhartian notion. And I use um, archaeology to demonstrate that there's a different way to think about Tlaxcala. Um, in essence, can you do the 10 minutes when sure. we get toward the end? Yeah. Okay. In, in essence, um, there is um, 
16 uh, noble houses that existed and a number of smaller uh, villages that, w that existed within Tlaxcala um, that formed a confederacy. And that this confederacy then was in a state of change at the time that Cortez arrives. It's at a state of, of some of the more powerful noble houses are exerting authority over other noble houses. They're beginning to consolidate. So while it's a dispersed com um, community and a confederacy, there's already a process of centralization that had begun to take place. Um, and here then, is the type of bureaucracy that the crown is envisioning right after the conquest that they would like to put into place. Now this is kind of one of those classic, um, what is the chain of command, the, the org chart you could say of the empire. And, and here you can see is where um, the Indian governors uh, and alcaldes, the municipal leaders are under a corregidor, under the governor of the viceroyalty, under the president of the audiencia. And one of the reasons I like showing this is that people often think that this bureaucracy is set in stone and they don't recognize that putting it onto paper gives it a sense of legitimacy and a sense of concreteness that in practice it did not yet have. That this is what they want to arrive to, but they have not yet arrived to. They have a vision of where it should be, but putting it into practice is a much more complex process. And so um, indigenous people then, one of the things that I did is this is, um, I've adopted this from, uh, uh, um, Gerhardt has this, but I've put arrows going both ways because this is a very dynamic process going back and forth between these different um, levels within the hierarchy. It's not the crown um, uh, sending commands down and indigenous people responding, but there's all these different ways in which indigenous people can connect. And, and in my stories you saw within the paper, indigenous people indeed are working up the chain of command. 1528, Tlaxcalan send a delegation over to Iberia to ask that they never be placed into an encomienda. And indeed, they're granted that. Um, and in being granted that they never be placed into an encomienda, they are given the right that their land will always be under their authority um, and that that land and whatever jurisdiction they had, they'll continue to possess throughout the colonial period. Um, this, then in uh, 1535, they return once again to Iberia, and this time they realize that there's a transition that's taking place. So in that first period, that claim that they will not be placed in an encomienda, just in those six years, there's a shift in that being placed into an encomienda, as you may know if you look at the literature from the colonial period, the Crown was very concerned about encomiendas, not only because of the ways in which encomiendas were exploiting in, uh, indigenous people and they were hard to manage because of the distance to the Crown, but also because by having encomiendas you have the um, potential of establishing another military aristocracy that is very powerful as existed within Iberia and that's not what they wanted. They didn't want to perpetuate the medieval hierarchy. They were trying to begin to shift to another type of governance which again is the bureaucracy. Now within a bureaucracy you can have um, a, a variety of constituents that are connected to that bureaucracy and the, the, the way in which Tlaxcalans decided to present themselves in the first time was we are lords of Tlaxcala and we present ourselves. In 1535 again only six years later when they return they present themselves as um, Maxix Katzen is a, an elected governor and he says I am the elected governor of the city of Tlaxcala and or, or the, the municipality of Tlaxcala and we're pursuing the title of loyal city and indeed the crown gives them that title. Now that's a very significant title within Iberia because a municipality could either be a, t a, um, a village which has very little rights and generally is under the authority of either the church an aristocrat or a um, city. You can be a town which has more rights and a town can stand autonomous directly under the crown or you can be a city and a city always is directly under the crown and the city has the right to always self-govern and to have its own elected officials governing itself and so it, it's able to 
um, create much more political autonomy within the system, as well as it's able to create its own boundaries. And that's one of the things that Tlaxcalans very much pursued. Now, this is something that I think is rather fascinating. Again, this is from Gerhardt, Peter Gerhardt. Um, it's a, a great source, and it's a source that's been around for a long time. But these are the types of municipalities that existed in the 1520s. Shortly after the conquest, they began to carve them up. But you can see they're, they're huge spaces, um, and uh, there's, a, there's major cities over, over these spaces. And it's during this time period that Tlaxcala, um, shortly thereafter, within 30 years, began to define its own municipal um, uh, um, space through lawsuits. So first it um, began to sue Huayotengo, which is down here. Later it sued Puebla, or Extacmachitlan, and Puebla. And it began to, in suing each of these um, neighboring communities, it began to establish its boundaries. What is the space that separates them from the other people? One of the things I think is really fascinating about this um, as an indigenous community is that they didn't just say, listen, we've already had this spot. This is our spot. This is all we're asking is, is this line right here. No, what they did is there's a, there's a type of land that had always existed around this um, uh, confederacy called Yautlali, which means warring land in Nawa, and essentially it's a type of land that you use as sort of a buffer zone. So they're up on hills and mountains overlooking this, this land that's a little bit lower, um, and it allows them to protect themselves from potential attacks from the Mexica and other indigenous communities allied with the Mexica. And when they began to assert themselves in the colonial period, they began to lay claim to this land and literally push their boundaries out. So one of the points that I make in the paper is that they're not previously, they don't conceptualize themselves as people with jurisdiction over territory. Rather, they're a people with jurisdiction over other people. And it's during this time that they began to lay claim to territory and they began to gradually transform themselves to a people with jurisdiction over territory. In that their laws don't just apply to the um, other people within their community, but begin to apply to people who are within this territorial space. And that's a very significant shift that begins to take place in the process of them asserting these boundaries. And it happens that they also are extending their boundaries and, and the territories that they have control over in the process. Now, going back to what I had said previously about uh, my conceptualization of this as opposed to a Lockhartian or a Gibsonian conceptualization is that Charles Gibson, um, who wrote in the 50s and 60s, when he went and did his research on Tlaxcala, he, he originally asserted, which uh, part of this I do agree with, he said, you know, there is no evidence that before 1545, um, once they had established themselves as a city, they then establish a Spanish cabildo. And in 1545 is when, for the first time, they began talking about a four-part division, meaning this, this territorial space that gets created gets divided into four parts. And what Gibson essentially argued, very much reflecting his generation, is that this was an imposition of Castilian notions of the way municipalities were organized and that it is a colonial construction. That in, in essence, that the arrival of the Spanish Empire was a rapid and profound transformation of the way that they governed themselves and the way that they thought of themselves spatially within this, um, uh, this region. Lockhart, on the other hand, attempts to make a, a um, pull, go back into the pre-colonial period and attempts to make an argument that this four-part division existed in the pre-colonial period and that this was a complex altipetal. Um, and I argue against both of those and that his argument is that as a complex altipetal, that altipetals usually are just one city-state, but this was a complex one that was four city-states that came together and combined and then became a municipality. But his, and his argument is that in becoming municipality, the political, spatial, um, conceptual structure that existed in the pre-colonial period continued. It essentially gets overlapped and it, he talks about it as a, um, an altipetal in Spanish guise, meaning that it's just a facade and an uh, overlay that doesn't really have an impact. So you get here then 
two notions of what happens to indigenous municipalities or indigenous communities. The one is a radical quick transformation with the arrival of colonialism. The other is native people aren't impacted. There's enormous continuities and change doesn't really happen until uh, later. And what I argue um, using this, the, really the same evidence, but using the archaeology that we had before, is that, wait a minute, um, these native communities were already in a, a state of flux. We can't make the assumption that change is only occurring and processes of negotiation are occurring because of, uh, the Spaniards arrived and because of colonialism. Change was undergoing before Spaniards arrived. And that this change continued to take place and what Spaniards brought was within the community new opportunities, meaning that there were already certain noble houses that were lobbying and, and pushing and exerting their authority. And with the municipality, they were able to consolidate that within their space. So they didn't do it because they said, oh, we are in a colonial situation. Now we need to do this. They did it because they said, you know, we've been doing, doing this uh, centralizing, doing this um, tr attempting to create a more centralized government, um, assert our, exert our authority over these other 16 noble houses. Here, this structure gives us the opportunity to do it. And so it centralized it in the city of Tlaxcala and, and then allowed them to exert their authority over the province as a whole. And then secondly, as I said, one of the things that having been a city who, who um, took on a cabildo structure, they were able to, within the larger whole of the empire, become rather um, autonomous, relative, ha, uh, able to uh, enjoy relative autonomy within the emerging imperial system. Because as a city, those are the rights and privileges that they automatically got. And so I'm challenging with this argument two of the existing predominant ways of thinking about indigenous people and the way that their municipalities um, and structures emerge. And here you can see this is what um, uh, New Spain looked like about mid-century. And it's very significant that Tenochtitlan takes on and is able to um, garner the status of city Cholula, Texcoco. Um, in 1543. I don't have the dates for Tenochtitlan and Cholula. Um, they're just not in, in the archives. Xochimilco in 1559, Tacuba in 1564, Huejotzingo 1556, Tepiaca 1559. There probably are many others, but these are the ones that I was able to find within the archives, um, indigenous communities within New Spain that had exerted themselves, um, petitioned for the right and status to be a city and acquired it. And were able to call themselves cities and then able to pursue certain rights and privileges um, with that status. And you can see that the way in which New Spain gets carved up, it is very much a uh, space of municipalities. And this is a slide that I think shows that, which is these are all the major um, urban centers in Latin America in the 16th century. And you can see that clustering right there in the center of New Spain. But if you take my argument and project it out, um, some of these are Spanish cities, some of these in, are indigenous cities, but people, people, not just Spaniards, and you know, not Spaniards did this, native people did this, people within the empire were negotiating their own autonomy within the system and pursuing rights and privileges. And pursuing the right and privilege of being a self-governing municipality was a very common practice um, for Spaniards and indigenous people. So um, I added a little bit, as you probably saw, to the first paper that I presented but tried to highlight some of the key things that, that I brought up in the paper. Now the second paper that I, that I had you read um, makes the argument that we have frequently um, perceived or understood the term indio as reflecting uh, Spaniards efforts to create a racial category and there's some people that have very much argued that this is a racial category or minimally it's a caste category. My argument is that the idea of caste and race in that sense really are it, enlightenment post-enlightenment constructs that if you go back to the 16th, 17th century for us to really understand what is going on, we need to use the language of that time period. And the way that people 
our understanding Indio or Espanol during that time period are as naciones. And once you rethink this category in that sense, it gives you a way to really rethink the way that people are interacting, the way they're conceptualizing themselves within a legal framework and its implications for a social political framework. Um, and that and nacion um, gives us much more insight and is a much more accurate way of thinking about Indio. And that native people, I think the other thing that's really significant is that Indio, by the end of the 16th century, takes on a connotation of miserable within the legal system, meaning people who need to be sheltered, protected, and guided. And one of the things that, that I say is that native people indeed start using the term Indio and use it and apply it to themselves. But in taking it on and applying it to themselves, there is not evidence that they're, that they're seeing themselves as part of a larger whole. And so they may say that, they, that uh, as I argue when I get into the Tlaxcala portion, they very much seem to know, listen, in this legal situation, it makes a great deal more sense to strategically use the term Indio. But they don't ever do, they don't ever take on, I am an Indio, you know, where I conceptualize myself as part of a larger nation or a larger group of people, that their identities, despite their use of terms like Indio, their identities remain very local in terms of seeing themselves as Tlaxcalan or Texcocan or um, Xochimilco, et cetera. And that, that this becomes very important in beginning to understand why now we can look and see a nation of Spaniards, but you don't see a nation of, say, Indians. That these are not categories, though legally at one point they have similar origins, their evolution is different to arrive, for us to arrive where we are today. And this then leads me to another, um, this is more directly from the book that I'm working on. One of the chapters I look at and argue that Within Tlaxcala, while it historically and, and continues in many ways to be perceived as an Indian community, in fact, if we look at it using terms of race from a modern standpoint, it's a very diverse community, not only within diversity of indigenous peoples, but also diverse in terms of um, Spaniards. And one of the things that's very interesting is through their lawsuits, this is a little hard to see on this, but there's shaded areas right here and here and right here, around here, and around here. This is a trail that goes through Tlaxcala. And this path that travels through Tlaxcala goes from Veracruz to Mexico City. And it's a very important path. In the pre-Hispanic time, this was a path on which traders would m go from Mexico City down to Veracruz and down to the Yucatan. Um, when Cortez arrived, he took that very path and traveled inland, which is why he passed through Tlaxcala on his way to Mexico City. And throughout the colonial period, um, this became a ritualistic path that people would take to reenact the conquest. Um, and it remained a fairly sim important um, path for transporting goods um, from place to place within New Spain. Now these areas, as I said, that are shaded in are where you find Spaniard settlements. And Spaniards that, have, that, that are part, that are within the community, um, they tended, the ones that are easy to identify because of lawsuits, tended to cluster right around these paths and right around these spaces that separated the communities here that were constantly kind of pushing on Tlaxcala. Tlaxcalans used the law to allow Spaniards to settle here as a buffer zone and to settle along this path because traders, Spanish traders going through, were often um, troublesome, created problems for the indigenous community, and so they let Spaniards settle right along that path because, and then ha move their community a little bit further away so that troublesome Spaniards traveling through wouldn't harass indigenous people but would, would be interacting with other Spaniards. Now what's significant about this, if you take my argument that indigenous people are negotiating these spaces, A, they've created a uh, political space where they've influenced settlement patterns within it and the way in which um, the space is 
is ethnically, biologically being configured, but more so if you take the idea of naciones, people often talk about the breakdown in the República Republica de Indios, República de Españoles, but what you can see by a pattern like this is that what's fascinating is that this is a legal indigenous space. Native people, in fact, are exerting themselves over these spaces um, these Spaniards in here are still accountable to Castilian law, and yet one of the things that's interesting is the 1654 case that I do mention in one of the papers by Huamantla right here. They made the argument that the Tlaxcalan Cabildo was taxing them too much and asking for too many that they have their militia prepared and ready to fight and was asking too much of them and they wanted to break off and have autonomy and be a separate um, town outside of Tlaxcala. And the Viceroy said, no, you can't, you are within Tlaxcala. So it becomes very interesting um, the way in which Spaniards, the, this is all, as I say again, considered, according to the Viceroy and even up to today, considered an Indian space. And yet, um, when the Viceroy saw th this, um, these people complaining about the Tlaxcalans, the Viceroy's response is, you're under their jurisdiction, you're, you're within their space. You either conform to what they're asking of you or you move. That you can't create your own autonomous space, but you're under the, uh, the authority of native people. And so part of my argument within thinking about naciones rather than race is that they aren't, they aren't thinking about this just in terms of a racial hierarchy as people have talked about, or a caste hierarchy as we discuss, as, one, as historians and anthropologists discuss in the 18th century. They're thinking about how do you create um, some type of logical, um, somewhat rational, spatial organization of these various legal political jurisdictions to where it's not quite so confusing because very much the movement into the modern day is trying to figure out how to rationalize law and governance and that the, the laws around naciones are about rationalizing them much more than about segregating native people and Spaniards, which, um, which counters, I think, one of the ways that people often think about this. So I'm going to stop there. I think I've thrown out lots of ideas, um, kind of some of the highlights of the papers that, that, I, that you read, um, added a little bit to it. So hopefully there's some food for thought, and, and then you have commentary. Thank you, Javita. Yeah. Well, um, first, just thank you for a really interesting uh, provocative paper and uh, for for giving us some um, some maps to to hang the the images of uh, of Tlaxcala that um, that we get in your writing on and I mean the, the I, I don't want to go on uh, terribly long here so that there's uh, plenty of time for discussion but um, I'm wondering if I mean as a as a sort of uh, uh, first question: If um, if we can begin to account for why it is that in uh, our training as as Latin Americanists, in the textbooks that that we've read, in works written uh, all the way through the the 1980s, that. Um, indigenously founded cities don't figure. Now, I mean, we have a whole series of them in Mexico. I know there are a number in, in Peru as well from really very recent scholarship, scholarship in just the last you know, four or five years, really, um, that has begun to explore, to, to actually uh, foreground uh, the degree to which um, core places, and one in Peru, Cajamarca, it turns out, uh, is, uh, is one such place. Um, uh, a city that was in fact founded by and for indigenous people. It's famous as the site where, where um, uh, Francisco Pizarro captured Atahualpa. Um, and depicted in textbooks as, I mean, in, t in two different ways, as this Inca town that is rapidly abandoned and then refounded by Spaniards, right? Then it becomes a Spanish city, 
So uh, it's an indigenous town only before the Spaniards arrive, and up until Atahualpa dies. And after that, since it's a city, since it's the capital of a, of a, a very large region, must be Spanish. Uh, other examples of this, um, Quetzaltenango, for example, in, in Guatemala. And I don't know what other Guatemalan towns actually have their origins in foundations sought by, promoted by um, indigenous people because the literature uh, just doesn't speak of them, at least not yet. So um, it really seems to me that there's... Uh, there's something requiring explanation. How is it that uh, the that towns and cities occupied by indigenous people could only be imagined by these previous generations of scholars as an imposition, undesired, unsought after, and that especially places that have achieved the status of city and capital of a province within the state. Um, you know, must have always been Spanish. And th that's a kind of one question. And the second one is in thinking about, um, well, you're the, the opposition you draw between the uh, Gibsonian and Lockhartian is Charles Gibson and James Lockhart's uh, uh, relative positions here. Uh, um, and your, your effort to, to kind of find a third way between these two extremes, one describing a radical break, the other describing um, uh, you know, general continuity, successful indigenous resistance. Yeah, and, uh, and I, I wonder if, if it is in fact the, these two paradigms that themselves have, have made it impossible to recognize this uh, level of this degree of indigenous, happy indigenous uptake, we could say, of, of certain Castilian forms, uh, adoption of practices that seem completely non-indigenous, I have to say, to, um, to the average uh, person in, in Peru or, or Bolivia or Mexico, an indigenous person is a, not a person who lives in a city. <laughs> I mean, if you live in a city, you're not indigenous, you're an Indian, if you live in the countryside, <laughs> uh, not if you live in a city. So uh, there is, uh, to some degree, a kind of an, you know, a, an antithesis in contemporary uh, uh, ethnico-racial categorization that makes it unimaginable. But, all right, the question is this. If Lockhart's position is, in the case of, if he were to apply it to the talk scala, that um, what you have here is a relatively long-term persistence of indigenous things. So the, the, the four divisions of the city, well, though that's, that's how the, um, the original confederation survived in, in, in the guise of, of something that was acceptably Spanish-looking. Um, how can you then account for the erasure of, uh, of that sort of recognition of indigeneity that follows. Um, and I mean, it certainly would be the case in, in Cajamarca that you would be hard pressed to find anybody there who would uh, recognize that this place was, was founded by indigenous people or that you know, it, <clears throat> it was governed by an indigenous uh, cabildo or um, you know, that, that in fact uh, uh, you know, you have many decades of struggle before Spaniards are actually able to insert themselves into the, into the city council there. Um, how, could, how does Lockhart reconcile these two things? And I've read his, his work, and in fact, you know, what he's not going to tell you is, is the story that, that you've just uh, told us about, uh, about these foundations, about active... Uh, engagement and negotiation with the crown. It's always a story about suffering and <clears throat> resigned acceptance of that which can't be resisted. <laughs> right? And heroic um, uh, uh, preservation of cultural um, coherence behind that facade of, 
of, of, of, of resigned acceptance. Um, well, those are a, a couple of questions that, that I would leave, leave you with. And one thing that, that, that seems to me perhaps less, less important, but it's a question nonetheless, and it's not something you've just brought up here, but that uh, in, the, in the paper of the same title, um, the one that's about to appear in a volume edited by uh, Susan Kellogg and Etelia Ruiz, um, is to identify this, this transitional moment, this moment of, of shift when that indigenous people took advantage of, when they saw that models of governance were under debate, uh, that there was some kind of flexibility um, that they might be able to take advantage of. You contrast the r sort of rational bureaucratic state with the um, uh, patrimonial um, uh, rule by aristocrats, right? And crown with aristocrats uh, under their, their um, control. And characterize the former as absolutist. And I was just wondering the, the, the rational bureaucratic, which clearly, you know, you're, you're kind of associating with an 18th century uh, moment when the crown aims to achieve. But I guess the question is, it, it, it struck me as, as um, I'm not quite sure why. I use that term. Why you seize on that term, since it's also a term that's under a lot of dispute. And anyway, just a, a couple of questions to, to start with. Great. Should I answer these and then if, open it up? If you could, uh, just, um, just briefly. Briefly. OK. All right. <laughs> Um, so I think that kind of to put the first two questions uh, a little bit together in terms of indigenous foundings, why don't we see it? How does Lockhart reconcile this and, and not see these things himself? I think one of the challenges is that I've written uh, another piece that, that hasn't been published because I can't decide what I want to do with it. But I, I, I traced that very question. And, and within that, one of the things that I think is significant is that in the 50s and 60s, uh, into the early 70s, people were um, still saw an imposition of empire and, and saw Native people responding to that. And this was a period in which Native people didn't have a lot of agency. In the 60s, 70s, beginning of the 80s, people began to, historians, um, anthropologists began to work together the emergence of ethno history. But with that emergence, people very much began to turn to various theoretical paradigms. Um, starting with Marx, and Marx was a very dominant paradigm. Um, but what, what that really did in, in terms of looking at those paradigms is they really took the same coin and just turned it over. And, so, and, and they never really challenged the imposition of empire, but rather they used Marx and then later Gramsci, you get the um, whole idea of uh, imposition of a hegemonic power, and then later Foucault in which um, it's a more dispersed power or um, um, I, I guess Kellogg uses uh, a, um, hegemony, um, but you get it, it. They use these various types of very modern theories um, and modern ideas of empire to begin to understand native people. And part of my argument is to really contextualize it within the 16th century, that these modern notions of empire, these modern theories of power don't work. They don't really help us understand that we have to really dig and be very authentic to the time and, and space and the specificities that are being um, enacted in that 16th century. And, and I think um, the, so in that sense, the ways in which people think about power have made it really hard for them to see indigenous people acting. Because there's this great line that I actually really like, and, um, and part of it because it's great to respond to, um, that Karen Spaulding, who's a wonderful person, wrote in her book on um, Wadu uh, that people, that indigenous elite chose to either be indigenous or elite. And, that, and that's part of the same type of paradigm in that if you act outside your community, you stop being indigenous. But if you act within your community and defend it, you stop being able to be elite within this emerging political structure. And so that really pushed me when I started this work to think about, yeah, but what about people like Tlaxcalans? 
Um, why can't we see Native people acting outside of their community? Um, and why can't we see those activities? Because, and, and my response to that, um, in addition to what I just argued, is that the other problem is that we've seen Native people um, as being subjects of ethno-historians and anthropologists in an ethno-historical um, mode, and that as ethno-historians, you look internally at how an ethnic group is responding to um, their world, the world outside them, which inherently, when you're looking into a community and you see change, um, you tend to reflect on it as change within this power system that you've constructed that is Marxian, Foucaultian, or Gramscian, rather than seeing ethnicity, removing ethnicity and writing a social history where indigenous people are the primary subjects. And in some ways, I kind of see myself as I'm sort of an ethno-historian, I'm sort of a legal historian, I'm sort of a social historian, and by not limiting myself to being an ethno-historian and studying an ethnic group, but rather seeing how a particular community is acting in the larger world rather than trying to document the change within that community, I think I'm able to begin seeing, wait, there's more than that's going on um, than these traditional uh, ways of thinking about change and transformation within a community, thinking about native action and that it's more than resistance. Um, of course, I'm also in a generation uh, I think for more than a, a, it's been more than a decade that people began to really challenge the notion of resistance. So it's also partly a reflection of my own generational um, shift that made people begin to rethink and you'll be a new generation that'll challenge the shifts that we've made and come up with new shifts. Um, <laughs> pardon? Scholarship is melancholy. Right, exactly. Um, why did I use absolutism? I think that I was trying to bounce off several books that, that were writing about the limits of absolutism um, and, and, and talk about, fine, if people are going to talk about this empire as being centralized and absolutist, then we have to say, then we have to rethink what absolutism is. Um, these particular papers that you read were, though they're just being published now, I actually wrote them five, six years ago, and since then I have changed my language, and in the book I probably, I, I don't, I'm not really using the term absolutism, I'm using much more descriptive language of, of what's happening. But I think that, that, that there, were, there was a number of books that were being published and, and continue to come out in which people are saying, okay, fine, you've called this absolutism, but if it is, then these are all the flexibilities and, and problems with that term, and that it's not absolutism, uh, in practice, it's absolutism maybe in theory that the neo-scholastics that are influencing the way people think about how governance should occur may be thinking and articulating it in a way that could be identified with the word absolutist, but that's in practice not what's happening. And I think that I was trying to pull that apart. If I just real Present. quick follow-up to, to just that issue, that it it seemed to me, and just uh, <clears throat> a few minutes ago in, in, uh, in the class, we were, um, I was going on a bit about what, um, <clears throat> I don't have an alternative term to absolutism, but w why you might have been tempted to use it. And it seems to me that there is evidence of, um, although one can't argue that this form of governance gives the king the kind of power to enact his will that theorists of absolutism, you know, um, uh, want to see. Um, in fact, it, it provides a really kind of weak base for, for the imposition of power. There's all kinds of negotiating. You have to deal with all these municipalities, and including the Indians, right? Um, there is something that's maybe beyond rational bureaucratic. I'm not sure that this kind of Weberian term to describe what's right. going on. I mean, there is a creation of a bureaucracy, but there's something else, which is the recognition by all parties of the priority and power and of, of law and judicial procedures, and that there is no way to proceed without maneuvering through law and judicial procedures and notarial, uh, you know, notaries and, and archives. Right. And 
is that bureaucracy? I don't know. I mean, it's sort of. It's something else, though. It's a whole conceptual order. It's a way of thinking about, um, uh, you know, how social constraint is um, uh, it, it can be successfully imposed and and resisted and negotiated. And I know if you, uh, one one final thing. We've had a lot yeah. of conversations in the past about negotiation, which um, clearly is some is something that's going on here. And yet, I really wish there were another word. I know, um, and I've, I've, I've said this yeah. in other contexts, and, but you know, I, I wish there were another word because that, that it's about business. It's, yeah. such a, it's such a sort of a, you know, post-enlightenment uh, way of imagining how social relations are, are worked out that, um, you know, that makes it sound like a business transaction. Mm. As opposed to say, um, um, you know, a form of, uh, of um, I don't know, collective bargaining or a subordination to a higher, higher cause, and in this case, it's not subordination to the king; it's subord subordination to the law, which the king also subordinates right. himself to. Right. So, I don't know. It's a, a general dissatisfaction, I guess, with with the terms and wish there were others, but I, I don't think that, uh, that social theory is here yet. And It depends on when they settled, which is very, which um, is another chapter in the book is to talk about this process. Um, if they settled before the 1550s, they could very well be citizens of Puebla or citizens of Mexico City, because before that time, Tlaxcalans were still conceptual. It was they were in a transition from 1520s to 1550s, from seeing themselves as having jurisdiction over people to jurisdiction over space. Um, and it's during that time period that some of these people settled, and then Tlaxcalans, they had legal title, so they could not be removed. Um, and so those particular people would be under uh, the authority of the, those particular cabildos. And of course, all Spaniards, as long as they identify as Spaniards and, and culturally act as Spaniards, are under the authority of Castilian law. Um, and that kind of is the larger, larger imperial law that would, that would pertain to them. People that once Tlaxcalans had kind of um, established their boundaries, the Spaniards that moved in after that, one of the th things that I've argued elsewhere is that Tlaxcalans, so I'm taking a step back to then answer your question, Tlaxcalans pursued laws that said no Spaniards or mestizos or blacks or Griego, you know, all these people cannot settle here. But what's fascinating is that they pursued those extreme laws at the same time that they actually were marrying their daughters to Spaniards, they were donating land sometimes to Spaniards to incorporate them into the community. So in essence, they used those laws to exclude people who don't want to conform to local authority and norms. And so many of these Spaniards in here are very hard to find um, uh, and um, and so these gray zones are, are a little bit misleading in that there's probably Spaniards in other spaces, um, but they're Spaniards that are conforming. They may very much still identify as Spaniards, but they're, but they're in harmony with the local community, so they're not coming up in legal documents as points of conflict, in, in, except for these random spaces where I see them, where in a cabildo meeting they're talking about deciding to give land to somebody, or, you know, or, some, or a Spaniard who is a problem um, talks about the, the boundaries of his ranch and he mentions the Spaniards around him which suggests that all those Spaniards where lawsuits were never brought against them are, are not in conflict with the community because the community was quite active at bringing lawsuits against Spaniards that created problems for them and so it's very interesting in that sense um, the ways in which 
uh, they conformed, um, and um, I don't know that they necessarily took um, their disputes. Maybe if there was a local dispute with an indigenous community, they would let the cabildo resolve it. Those things were all done very informally, so there's not documentation. Um, but we do know, as I said, Wamantla, interestingly, they in 1654, so that's you know 100 years later, they're saying we want to be separate and they're taxing us too much. So there are Spaniards that are being taxed, but those records are really, uh, it's very difficult to kind of pull it out and figure out what Spaniards are where and who's being taxed. But we do know some Spaniards are in the area being taxed um, and, and owe tribute, and, that, and it's part of the tribute that gets collected, which is fairly nominal, or of the tribute that gets collected, a nominal amount goes to the king. Thank you so much for a very provocative talk. And, and uh, one thing, I mean, uh, one of the things I see you doing, and I think I completely go along and it's very enlightening, is to, put, to, to show how notions such as empire, colonialism, are much more complicated than we have been accustomed to. I mean, in terms of hegemony, resistance, a clear-cut separation between, you know, colonizers, colonized, that everyone has a stake in the system, everyone produces the system, and notions such as resistance are, are inadequate to, 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 to deal with that kind of complexity. I see you, however, making a, an even stronger claim like that. I mean, that is already more than enough to me, and I think it's great. But I see you making a stronger claim that I am, I don't know if I can go along with it. Mm. And the stronger claim, it seems to me, is that to say that the forms of colonial forms are emergent out of a situation of multiple ne negotiations, right? When in fact it seems to me that all the terms that you are bringing into discussion from municipalities to, to, to are not actually emergent. I mean, are, are forms that are brought from, that doesn't mean that they are imposed in any single-minded way. No, it's true. I mean, you show very well how Tlaxcalans want to have their, you know, their, 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 their forms of social organization define the city that is not imposed on them in any single mind. That you show very well, but it seems to me that still the terms in which they are conducting their actions, the framework, the general framework uh, in which their agency can be authorized is a colonial framework. I mean, you know, in that, in that respect, it's not, it's not something that is fully emergent. Okay, so what is emergent is the different possibilities that you, but, but the forms are not emergent in any, in any way. The other thing is that then, then in connection, so, so I, want, I want you to comment on that. And the other question has to do with negotiation, actually, with what uh, Tom mentioned before. Uh, let's see if I can, how, how I can put this. Uh, the, 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 these things are, I mean, how do these things get there? Right? How do these things get there? I mean, how do, do no, notions of cities, municipalities, et cetera, et cetera. If we adopt a model according to which there is on the one hand a crown who wants to who wants to develop a certain bureaucracy, centralized bureaucracy, and, and come in direct contact with the municipalities in Spain. And on the other hand, you have this warring nobility. And if we assign the role of warring nobility only to the Spaniards that are arriving, right? So, you know, then where do all these notions about city when in fact we know that these Spaniards from the beginning were also interested in it's constructing city. cities, right. in constructing municipalities, in construct so there's a model that doesn't allow itself to be that clear cut which is again the problem with calling it absolutism, right? I mean right. there is a pactism that is going on well exactly. in very complicated ways. Right. So and that notions like negotiation, I don't know which can get out of, because there is also the notion of, you know, the good life, uh, Thomist notions in the case of Suarez and all the theologians of how, how the, rational, the rational order of the world and how you become part of it. So those are the kinds of things. I, I don't know if I was coherent. <laughs> no, I think those are really good questions. I think that what I would argue is, um, is that I'm arguing the whole notion of imposing a, um, a colonial system is, is based on theoretical frameworks that are more structuralist. And what I'm arguing uh, is really, if you take it to a theoretical level, is a process of structuration. Okay. That empire is an ongoing process of structuration. So I, I definitely am not saying that it's chaotic and everyone's contributing equally and that 
th that a cabildo uh, doesn't doesn't reflect um, Castilian norms. But what I would argue is that there's a structure that's there, but even a cabildo, as you trace these things back to medieval Iberia, all of these systems and structures back to medieval Iberia, they're being um, developed and played out within a space, and, and I suggest this in the paper on nations and self-identification, is they're being played out and constructed within a space in which they have to be flexible to local custom and norms. And so the structure itself that is being brought over is a structure that inherently has has been has been created in a way that's flexible that people can insert themselves in and it allows for um, distinct local culture custom law um, and insertions and that that these processes and I think that an, an, another part of that um, to think about structuration then. So that's at the local level, at the imperial level, um, that these processes then are shaping uh, a process that is more organic than imposed. And, and so what, what that means, for example, is that this wasn't in any of the papers, but you see Tlaxcalans um, uh, asserting themselves and asking for things like confining livestock and, and Spaniards uh, keeping their livestock in certain places, et cetera, et cetera. Now in Iberia, livestock is um, prioritized over farming. Um, and so fences that are put up um, are, are, people are required to fence in their fields, protect them from transient herds. Um, and the priority economically, politically, socially is for herds. The opposite happens in the Americas, which I think is very fascinating, which is the priority is the sedentary population and that herds have to be fenced. And to me, it's that type of thing is that you have that, that law and the social, political um, coming together of these people and processes by which they are affecting a new structure most definitely reflects both, but it's in that process of that contact and the con contestation maybe, um, um, processes by which they work out how to live harmoniously together, that that structure that was is transformed and that, it's, that, it, that it is not the same structure, that, it, that it's an organic process that reflects the people that are there and that it gets transformed and something new is emerged. Now, that law still gets compiled and written down in Roman script and, and um, is part of a recopilacion, which is part of a Spanish tradition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's elements of it that, right, you can't deny it. But I think that part of is that that is at the imperial level, but I think part of explaining continuities at the local level is also, you know, taking that process of structuration and knowing that at the local level those processes of structuration are about Spaniards conforming to local indigenous structures. And so the empire, the, the, the macro vision, the, the, the thing that is, that, that, uh, is the moving structure adjusting may reflect Castilian governance procedures but the local very much reflects indigenous processes and procedures that Spaniards are having to adopt to because even in Iberia, you know, you have multiplicity of local culture, community, language, legal systems, um, and that's the way the governance system is set up. And so that's how I, so I don't, I, I think that I get really, I don't like um, overcasting native agency. I think I'm, I try to be really realistic about native agency, its impact, but I really want to push it as far as I can to say h how does native agency play out and um, what are the implications? And you know, I'm constantly in all my work trying to juggle between local and really concrete on the ground and, and the imperial level for that very reason. Did I answer both, I think? No, I, 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 think I just, I mean, I completely agree with the impulse. I, 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 I agree with almost everything you said.
I wonder if the, if the in, as a metaphor, negotiation. Yeah, yeah I don't. Is I, it's interesting. You to do that. Well, well I, the thing is, it's interesting is that uh, I think in the last two years, since you know we had we had that very intense conversation about this in Seville. I don't think I use the term, I think I'll use the verb they negotiated, or I'll use the verb they petitioned. I think I try to use more, really, 16th century, they petitioned the crown. They, you know, uh, they filed a loss. You know, uh, I think that in the, I, I'm trying to move away from uh, really grounding it just in that idea of negotiation, because I do think, it's also, it's also the term that everyone's floating around right now, right? And so I'd, I want to really avoid, re <laughs> Because what I hear it's you in the title of the book. To do is going the construction of empire is not in my title. Yeah. Oh, it's in the title of their book, the <laughs> yeah. book of that article, right? Yeah. <laughs> what I see you doing is trying to go back and forth between structures and structuring processes. That right. is a very complicated thing, and that's what I think the term can get in the way of a. That's a really good point. Yeah. Well, and that's exactly this is the goal: is that the book actually is called the construction of empire. Mm -hmm. And that it, and the idea is to look at how empires get constructed, and and recognize that that process that that's a process, um, and that it's an ongoing process that that has to be responsive. Once it stops being responsive, it becomes rigid and it breaks. Yeah. I thought you were going to say something about the idea of race. Wondering if you have any thoughts about um, the way it plays out differently for indigenous um, um, Latin American populations and the displaced African populations that are also uh, referred to as naciones by the crown. But surely there's a very different process there because these are um, um, confrarias and, and associations uh, that compose people from completely different places. Do you have any thoughts? Well, I'll start by saying that one of my graduate students who is working on um, Africans in the Americas came in and said, oh, I read your article, now it makes sense to me. And I said, yes, but I very intentionally only talked about Native people because I'm, I, I quite honestly, I'm not 100% sure. I think, uh, oh, I just spaced out his name, he's in Wisconsin, and I quote him in my, book, in my paper. Uh, Steve J. Stern? No. No, not Stern. Um, <laughs> He's worked on Africans, and he's one of the people that argues that the idea of race and racism has its roots in, in the Iberian world. Um, I think that it's very complicated, and I, I, I feel as though on one hand I'm not enough of a specialist and haven't looked at the primary sources to really say it's exactly the same. Um, I think one of the big differences, I think in many ways it's very similar but one of the fundamental differences between indigenous people and Africans is that in a Spanish mindset, Africans had already been exposed to Christianity, and so they were in a different categorical space than native people who hadn't been exposed to Christianity. Um, and so for that reason, as a nation, um, with them being perceived as a nation, you interact with that nation differently because it's a nation that um, a nation of apostates. No? That's right. It's an exactly. <laughs> whereas, whereas <laughs> native people are potential. Uh, they potentially can create utopia and bring you know um, heaven on earth, and and there's all these possibilities that Spaniards see with that. Whereas um, you know Moors and um, Turks and Africans were people who had been exposed and weren't. Converted and and you know there's a complexity of some were converted and uh, still remained slaves and and that that was illegal and I think that it's it's a much more complex thing and I'd have to write uh, it would take research I I would need to really research that with primary sources before I'm really to to say definitively uh, this is how it worked I think that the idea of nation still holds up but I think that it needs to be teased out in a much different way because um, the way that the relations between Portuguese and then Castilians with Africans um, played out in the 16th, 17th century. The, so that's a very unsatisfying answer, I think. You know, I'm just thinking also the way that uh, in, uh, I'm from Brazil, uh, you have many Africa, Af afro Brazilian communities that use the word today. Nation. nation. To talk about themselves. Right. And, and this is, and I feel that the, the word is 
race is much more resilient as a, as a, as a category, uh, uh, an ideological category than a nation in. Well, it is since, since the end of the 18th century. What? Well, race. nation had, a, you know, several centuries of solidity before race came along. <laughs> and race hasn't been along still as long as, as Nacion was, was used, I would say. But I don't know. <laughs> well, and also I think some of them were, were communities that established <laughs> nations within a nation, right? I mean, um, the Quilombos very much as exerted the, asserted themselves as we are a nation separate from the empire, and um, they were a diverse group ethnically um, rather than like Tlaxcalans. I mean, that's the, other, that's the other complex piece of it, right, is, is to, to do the same type of article uh, would be very different because a Africans are brought over and they're not left within communities, but rather, you know, they're mixed um, with other uh, kingdoms, communities, cultures, and if I could just throw throw in something on the on the question of Nacion, this is something I've I've written about too. Um, it really depends. Uh, the The usage of that term shifts very quickly from the the early 18th century and before when it has, you know, very specific meanings. And in, in, uh, in the early colonial period, um, Africans are not of Nacion Africano. It's not a geographic term in that sense. It's much more specific. They're the Nacion de Angola. Right. Or the Congo. I mean, those are the Naciones. They're actually, you know, of, of sort of linguistic, um, uh, territorial units that are imagined to be a Nacion. Nacion is a patria chica for everybody. And, and, and Indios, it's not Nacion Indio. It's uh, sp the specific Tlaxcala is a nacion, right. right? The Confederacy of Tlaxcala, that's a nacion. The Mexica, that's a nas nacion. Um, they're, they're sort of uh, geographically demarcated pre-Columbian units that have some kind of genealogical, um, and, you know, and linguistic and, and I don't know, gastronomic uh, homogeneity. And then in the, at the end of the 18th century, it all becomes terribly muddled. And, and so you get in, in the context of cities, Indians who have moved to Spanish cities, who, were, who you can no longer trace to uh, some pre-Columbian, uh, you know, um, um, uh, lineage or, you know, rural sort of place. Um, and they are de nacion we don't know, right? And there's a, there's a term for that. It's called Indio Criollo, which is what happens with Africans. Uh, the descendants of Africans who you can no longer identify you know, as to their origin in a particular place in Africa become um, Negros Criollos. Uh, just like American-born Spaniards who are disconnected from, from the place that their ancestors are, are, were from in, in, a, in Iberia become Españoles Criollos. And for several decades, those, th those are the terms, Criollos, that define this set of people with kind of ambiguous status as to Nación. And, and at the end of that period, Nación comes to mean something very different. It's identified with the state. And it's adopted by Criollos, in particular. Um, and I think but. part of my <laughs> argument is also that there, within legal history, there's a um, there's a strong tradition to look at the process of rationalizing law, and how how these efforts came about, and it often gets tied to um, the rise of canon law, in 11th, 12th, 13th century and that state law emerges outside and as a reaction to that. And so part of what I'm, I think part of the extension of this as I've thought more about this particular piece is that it's also an argument about, well, law, rationalizing law in terms of thinking about a pluralist, uh, legal pluralist society, those processes of rationalizing are also about kind of the, the legal relationship that exists between crown and the people. And so I think that 
the, that part of what indios is, is it's a term to identify a particular type of legal relationship that's very distinct. And so that's why, and why I think then the Crown actually, you're right, predominantly there's a, a discussion of Tlaxcalas and Nacion, but there's also numerous times where they say Nacion de Indios, or in, in Cavarubias dictionary, he talks about that as a, a Nacion. But I think that there, it's known that it's different than the Naciones that you're talking about, which are about culture and some connection, but this is a constructed artificial Nacion that is just has meaning within a legal framework. And I think that's part of my part of my argument that it's about these processes of legal rationalizing um, that, that legal historians often talk about. 